Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first panel discussion of this academic year entitled Genomics, a Multidisciplinary Review. Uh, today we have speakers from the field of genomics, infectious disease, and nephrology. First up, we have Dr. Eric Shad. Dr. Shad is a director of the Icon Institute for Genomics and Multiscale Biology and chair of the Department of Genetics and Genomic Sciences here at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He received his master's in pure mathematics from UC Davis and his PhD in biomathematics from UCLA. He's an expert on the generation and integration of very large-scale sequence variation, molecular profiling, and clinical data in disease populations for constructing molecular networks that define disease states and link molecular biology to physiology. Dr. Dina Altman is an assistant professor in the departments of medicine, infectious disease, and genetics and genomic sciences. She received her medical degree from Ben Gurion University, after which she pursued her medical residency at Bellevue Hospital. She completed her fellowship in infectious disease here at Mount Sinai. Dr. Altman's research focuses on the pathogenesis, epidemiology, and genomics of Staph aureus, and she's the initiator of the collaborative surveillance program at the Mount Sinai Health System, which uses genomics to define bacterial diversity. Dr. John He is a professor in the departments of nephrology and pharmacological sciences, and he's the division chief of nephrology. He received his medical degree at the Shanghai Second Medical College and obtained a PhD from the University of Paris. He completed his residency in internal medicine at SUNY Downstate, after which he completed his fellowships in both metabolic diseases at the NIH, as well as nephrology here at Mount Sinai. His major research areas include protocyte biology and pathology, signaling networks in kidney cells, systems biology of kidney diseases, and kidney fibrosis. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Great, well, thank you. And I will be blazing through a bit of an overview in preparation for the, for the other two who will maybe do a, a little bit deeper of a dive. Uh, I have no biases in my research, but I must list my uh, as association. So I'm on the SAB of a number of companies and a board of directors for SAGE and Whole Biome, a microbiome company. So the DNA sequencing technologies, as uh, many of you know, uh, have, have uh, been just transforming how we look at living systems, how we think about disease. Uh, and just life in general. And this is just a curve showing you the acceleration of the sequencing technology from the standpoint of cost of, of sequencing. And it's the only technology in, in human existence that's beat Moore's law. So it's a truly phenomenal uh, time in biology to witness something like that. And of course, the technology is becoming more and more accessible, right, as we see technologies like Oxford Nanopore with a handheld USB device that you can plug directly into your laptop and do sequencing on the fly. So they're still in the process of working out some of the bugs, but this technology is being used in a number of papers written, and this is sort of the future of, of how accessible, you know, these are going to be things that you're taking off the shelf at Walgreens and able to sequence whatever, whatever your heart desires. Uh, some of the technologies, like the PacBio technology I was involved in generating, is doing true single molecule sequencing in each of those nano wells, uh, being observed in real time, and then multiplexing that over hundreds of thousands of, of those nano wells. Uh, and, and that's sort of the power um, that, that we're on the verge of. You know, in the next five to ten years, we'll be doing terabase level sequencing in, in minutes, right? So that would be sequencing everybody in this room in a matter of minutes. And uh, so the ability to process things uh, on the fly and in real time. And one of the things we pioneered just in preparation for Dina's talk is, is on, you know, how do we in real time uh, affect uh, our ability to characterize pathogenic outbreaks. So this is just an example of how the technology, I think, has impacted uh, medicine. So we uh, had in 2010 during the cholera outbreak, uh, you might remember they, they had the uh, bad um, uh, earthquake, and that was followed by uh, this horrible uh, outbreak of uh, cholera, and there were all sorts of political forces at play trying to uh, pin the, the blame on the UN troops, and those in the U.S. were saying, no, the UN didn't bring this. It was this derived naturally from the waters of, of Haiti, and so it became a very political battle, but nobody using actual science to sort of support their claims. Um, so we gave the first demonstration at that point of the power of the technology that's emerging. Uh, and this was the PacBio single molecule real-time sequencing where we retrieved 
samples in Haiti to sequence them to characterize that, that cholera genome and compare it to other cholera genomes around the world. Uh, and we had a, from the, from the collection of the data in Haiti or the collection of the samples in Haiti to a, a report in the New England Journal was 30 days. Right, so 30 days to collect the sample, sequence, analyze, write the paper, go through review, and then publish. So it was an unprecedented um, sort of uh, uh, effort. And what our results showed is that indeed the uh, cholera outbreak in Haiti uh, derived from uh, South Asia. And so the most likely cause was were UN troops from South Asia coming into Haiti uh, that brought it there. And it was completely unrelated to Latin American strains. Uh, so if, if it were to derive naturally from the waters of Haiti, you would think it was more related to the Latin American strains, and that wasn't true. And so we were the group that resolved uh, the origins of that bug and, and where it came from. But again, the power there is just in, the, in how the technology was able to uh, sequence that very quickly. Then we also had the first demonstration. Uh, this again was from the cholera bug. It's actually a complicated bug, two, two chromosomes. And what had never been done before is a completely automated finishing of a genome. So what that means is you put the sample onto the device to sequence it, and then you analyze the data and come out with a complete genome. So that had never been done before. What happens is you do that first step, and then there are all sorts of gaps, and you have to manually fill them in through lots of uh, extensive experimental work at the bench. Uh, but we demonstrated for the first time that you could actually, you know, the technologies were now good enough to come up with complete uh, holistic characterizations of the genome and why that matters, like why does that matter, especially for, for clinical care, where in the context of, of resolving um, pathogenic outbreaks, you know, the, the pieces in, the, in these bugs that, that, you know, cause the bad things to happen, uh, the ordering of those pieces can be very important. There's lots of times repeating of those elements and the number of repeats or, or how they're positioned matters. And so we, for the first time, demonstrated that we could unambiguously resolve the ordering of any of these complex repeat structures that drive pathogenicity, right? So again, that was the first time being able to show that we could unambiguously resolve that and getting to a complete genome, something that you hadn't been able to do before. And so the way to think about this is the technologies that existed before our technology came out, short read technology would give you one view of the world and you think you might understand the scene that's emerging. But the long reads then could fill in the gaps, and what emerges is a completely different picture than, than, than what you thought, right? So this ability to lock in um, to, to the true view of what's happening in these systems is, is very important. So we next demonstrated that with the E. coli outbreak in Germany in 2011, where we again were able to very rapidly sequence that. So I don't know if you remember that outbreak, but it was a, it was a strain that had never before been seen to be so pathogenic. Uh, it had this hemorrhagic-like uh, phenotype, even though it was an uh, entroagrative uh, type E. coli from the serotypes. Uh, but we, again, sequenced it, had the complete view of the picture of what was going on, uh, and again, published a paper very rapidly in New England Journal, and basically showed that this entroaggregative strain that hadn't been pathogenic before had acquired pathogenic elements from horizontal gene transfers uh, from, from, from bad strains. And again, we were able to piece that together because we could sequence the entire genome in real time and then analyze all the pieces that were there, the ordering of those pieces and what effect they had on, on the system. And our uh, results also showed that if you treated this particular um, bug with um, Cipro, one of the most common treatments for uh, uh, these E. coli outbreaks, that it would actually activate uh, the shigatoxin uh, producing gene in, in, in those cells. And so what you're looking at here is in the presence of Cipro, you were 70-fold, sugatoxin was 70-fold increase over the control. And so from this, the guidance came out that you shouldn't treat this particular outbreak with Cipro because you'll just make people um, sicker. And then we eventually uh, had a subsequent paper published where we showed uh, all the elements that were actually responsible for driving the pathogenicity. And again, that all came from this whole genome sequencing. So we carried that out further. So the, so the E. coli and, and cholera, the bugs came first because they're smaller genomes, so it was an easier way to demonstrate the technology for smaller costs. And we recently, um, last year, Nature Bio or Nature Methods showed uh, the ability to apply this technology to get to the most comprehensive um, human genome, reference genome that had ever been done. And what, what you're seeing here is just a, a demonstration of 
the power of this technology to give us a, a more accurate genome with which to interpret. And so what you're looking at here, is, so think of the human genome and you have these repeat structures, right? You have genes that are repeated, you have low complexity regions that may be like GC rich, and they can stretch out for hundreds of thousands of bases, and those regions have never before been able to be resolved, right? Because what you've been looking at, the lens you've been looking at before had these reads that were like 100 bases long. So with 100 small puzzle pieces, so think of a puzzle where it's all like purple, it's all like one color, and you're trying to fit all those puzzle pieces together and they're really small, it's a very difficult problem. Whereas if you had bigger puzzle pieces that could extend out past the purple, you could unambiguously resolve it. And that's what's being shown here, the repeat structures in the human genome. This is the, um, the length of those repeat structures as we determine them by sequencing the human genome. This was the current state-of-the-art reference genome that everybody bases their analysis on. And what you see here is a very systematic bias and a downward bias of uh, the length of these repeat regions, meaning that the current references had compressed all of those regions because they couldn't re resolve the structure. And we basically opened up the floodgates on being able to interpret those. And much of that's polymorphic, much of it's driving disease, but we don't know that because nobody's been able to look before. So we've provided the first um, demonstration for the ability to be able to look at those regions and unambiguously resolve them and start associating them with um, disease. We've used this technology, this paper in, in, in Nature, where we were able to um, look at those tandem repeats. And again, using the long reads, we were able to exactly position haplotypes within cancer patients and show that the combination of, of these uh, tandem repeats stringing together uh, were rapidly evolving in response to treatment and led to um, resistance to treatment. And so we were the group with UC UCSF that um, sort of took FLT3, which had been one of the key therapeutic targets for pharma companies, but was given up because of the uh, lack of efficacy that was seen in the trials. And what we were able to demonstrate was that FLT3 was exactly the right target, but what was happening in those clinical trials was very rapid um, evolving of resistance to that therapy and we were able to pinpoint the cause of the, of the resistance, and so those programs continue today in, uh, in clinical testing to, to sort of get around the resistance that emerges. And once we have all of this information, we can start um, you know, coming up with you know, completely novel therapeutic points of intervention in, in novel genetic ways. Uh, so as, we, as this technology gets applied to bigger and bigger populations, we get more and more information on the variants that are driving disease or drug response or, or resistance. Today we manage databases that are sort of annotating on the order of 400 million variants, right? So lots of, lots of DNA variation that's been identified. And we have published this idea in Science a few years ago where we wanted to flip genetics on its head and start looking at, you know, can we identify variants in the genome that are offering people protection. So instead of, you know, most genetic studies are looking at people who are sick, have some disease, and then you're comparing them to some control group, and you're identifying variants, you know, frequencies that are different between the disease population and the control group, and then identifying what are the causes of that disease. What we said is, well, let's look at um, a converse problem, which is, who are the people carrying highly penetrant deleterious mutations that should have caused catastrophic illness, say, in their childhood, but they're in their adulthood and have never had the disease. So how did they buffer? However they buffer that disease becomes your therapeutic target. And the beauty of that genetics is you get the human, you know, pharmacologic proof of concept directly from the genetics. So we had presented that idea and then published on that um, a couple of months ago in Nature Biotech, where we looked at 600,000 genomes. And again, the idea was let's systematically look over these 600,000 genomes for individuals that harbor highly penetrant deleterious mutations that the medical textbook says should cause catastrophic illness before you leave your teenage years, uh, but these people are in their 50s and have never manifested uh, the disease. So we searched 600,000 genomes for that and identified 13 candidates um, from that screen across eight diseases that, again, these were what we call resilient individuals who were harboring highly penetrant mutations that should, they should have been dead. Uh, but they're in their 50s, and then the idea is then to decode those individuals and figure out how are they buffering the disease, because however they buffered it is, is your therapeutic, right? So think of PCSK9 and CCR5 for HIV infection and so on. So that's the strategy, but nobody's done this systematic look over the entire disease space. And so like, uh, for example, some of these individuals were cystic fibrosis cases, 
So that, you know, so think of Delta F508 mutations, medical textbook says you've, you've got cystic fibrosis, but these people are in their 50s, have never had lung respiratory distress or other um, uh, manifestations associated with cystic fibrosis. Um, so pretty amazing. Like, however, they buffer that disease, whatever the mechanism is, is, is uh, becomes your therapeutic. So we also now carry out uh, the use of this technology routine in, in clinical care. So, you know, the um, carrier screening uh, tests we offer here at Mount Sinai through the genetics lab, a 281 disorder test. Uh, it's the most comprehensive in the country and really becoming the standard of care at Mount, in the Mount Sinai Health System, which means it will spread um, across the country. And again, this is, these are the types of things that are enabled um, by the sequencing technology. The fact that the cost is so cheap, that it's so comprehensive, we can now provide for screens um, uh, uh, you know, before pre-pregnancy uh, about what your risks are of passing on uh, something bad to your, to your, to your children. And, you know, the standard of care used to be, right, the four, uh, four diseases and looking at a limited number of genotypes, so things like Tay-Sachs and cystic fibrosis, and now we're looking at 281 disorders where we can resolve, you know, we have a pan-ethnic panel to target uh, the Jewish population. That's, of course, special uh, in this area and other areas. Uh, so more accurately assess the risk uh, that you have of, of passing things uh, onto your children. And again, this is all motivated by the next generation sequencing technologies. Of course, the DNA is very important, right? So we, this technology enables us to take these holistic views and say a lot, and fundamentally we know DNA is important, and I always like to remind myself of that, that at the end of the day, the DNA you're carrying determines whether you're a frog or a, a human or a flower, so it's really fundamental. Uh, and the subtle variation and the more subtle variation in there is what can cause our predisposition to lots of different diseases uh, or protections and, and or what makes us uh, unique phenotypically. Uh, but we know that that information is, is necessary, but it's not sufficient to achieve understanding. And so we uh, see simple examples of how we can accumulate knowledge through the DNA, but not necessarily understanding of complex disease. And Huntington's is a good example of a of a disease that's been known for 30 years, the cause Mendelian disorder and the Huntington's uh, uh, gene, where the tandem repeat variations in that tandem repeat determine whether you're going to get Huntington's or not. But 30 years later, and lots of research, we still don't know mechanistically what causes Huntington's from that originating factor. We still don't have any effective treatments. We still have no way to prevent it uh, based on that information and, and no effective uh, cure. So even though we have had the knowledge for a long time, we're not getting at understanding. And the reason for that is, you know, DNA is just one dimension of many. As you know, you, know, you look at resources like the BioMe uh, Biobank that's here and other big populations that many of you here are in, involved in assembling, where we get much more information around an individual than just DNA, right? We, get, um, we can get RNA and, um, you know, microbiome and metabolome and proteome and, you know, all the different labs and procedures you have done and so on. And what we really want to be doing, of course, is integrating that information all together to come up with these pictures of, of biology. So this is just, uh, again, an animation that I've been showing for a long time, but it makes the point that you have, you know, biology is complex. You want to understand how all the different variables you're, you're collecting are interrelated. And, of course, they form complex, nonlinear structures. And these are the structures that are driving disease. And they don't act in isolation, right? They act in concert, in, in networks of networks. And so if we want to understand the complexity of disease, that's the level we need to be operating at. And so one of the first ways we're doing that here is by, is in cancer, the personalized cancer therapy program we have here at Mount Sinai, where we're taking on the cancer patients, not just sequencing the DNA from their tumor and their germline. We're also sequencing RNA in cases where we can get metabolome and proteome, we can do that. But then we're not analyzing that data in isolation. We're analyzing it in, in the context of all the digital universe of information that's generated on the cancers. We generate the models just like the animation I showed you, and then we interpret that, that patient's um, data in light of those models. And then we can start, uh, based on that information, start developing personalized uh, medicine. So we have clinical trials going on today 
where um, novel vaccines with Nina Bardwaj are being generated based on the patient's profile that we generate. They'll design a novel vaccine to activate that individual's immune system to attack the tumor. So that's one example of the sequencing technology combined with the modeling that's leading to personalized uh, therapy. We also have the study with Ross Kagan on the fly where he's making um, models of a patient's tumor in these flies and then high throughput screening the flies to identify drug cocktails that can target the tumor. But again, what constellation of, of genes that goes into the fly model is determined through the computational modeling based on the patient's tumor and the constellation of data around. So once again, once we have the model, we can look at the individual genes that are changed or a constellation of genes that are changed in the patient's tumor and understand what effect they have on the cancer driving network. So in that case, it didn't have a very big effect. So we can do this all in silico, systematically going through the network to identify what are the key driver genes, and every now and then we'll lock onto the gene that activates the entire network, suppresses it or activates it, and then Ross can take that gene in addition to the other genes we identify, bang them into a fly model, recreate that tumor in fly, and do high throughput screening across many hundreds or thousands of combinations of drug then those that hit you know, go into the person to treat, treat their tumor. And that's the clinical trial that's running um, today. Um, so then, yeah, so then just to make the point that we, again, can take all of that information, just like I was showing through the networks, identify the key points uh, that are dysregulated in all the cancer driver uh, pathways. Uh, so here showing, so in the animation I showed you the one gene that lit up the entire network. Well, in reality, there are many different hits that may exist in an individual's tumor hitting different can known cancer driver pathways that we're trying to, um, uh, that, that we can then turn around and treat. So it turns into a, a more complicated game than, than the single gene. Uh, but again, the idea is that we can computationally solve this problem and the clinical trial is just about showing how accurate, how accurate are those models. Like, are they accurate enough to be in routine clinical care where we should be interpreting all patients in this way? So that's the purpose of the trial. So then I'll just end with the, sort of the vision. Again, that's you know, what we hope, hope to do is have these complex models generating sequencing data and other phenotypes on individual patients, projecting that information onto these models and let the models tell us what's going on in an individual, what, what molecular systems are dysregulated or protecting them from certain diseases or drug responses, and then being able to match uh, whatever is being disrupted across individuals in a highly personalized way, you know, what are the drugs, what are the behavioral changes that are going to have the best impact on, on those individuals. And as the health systems kind of transform into this, uh, you know, treating the sick to wanting to actually prevent people from getting sick, you know, this, th these are going to be the kinds of technologies that, that, you know, provide the power that we need to better assess um, patient conditions. Uh, so with that, I'll welcome uh, Dina to drill a little deeper in, in certain aspects of that work. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. That was an amazing talk, Dr. Schott. And Dr. He, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I will go a little deeper into infectious diseases and applications of genomics. So I'd like to begin with your patient who, on hospital day three, develops fevers. And you draw blood cultures, and those blood cultures reveal MRSA. So you may be wondering, where did this MRSA come from? And I don't mean what was the point source, the primary source, meaning abscess or uh, pneumonia, but more globally, where did it come from? How did it reach your patient? Did it come from the patient's community, from the patient's gym, patient's pets? Did it come from other patients in the hospital who are at the, there at the same time? Did it come from hospital surfaces? Did it come from the patient's providers? What are the transmission dynamics of this pathogen? Moreover, let's say multiple patients in your ward have MRSA in the bloodstream. Are these the same MRSA? Are they different? What is actually going on? And the reason I bring up MRSA is because we have a problem with healthcare-associated infections here uh, nationally and locally. Here at Mount Sinai, uh, our rates for all healthcare-associated infections are twice where they should be, and MRSA, one of them. And all of this information is reported to regulatory agencies such as NHSN and CMS and publicly reported. So this is a plug for all of you to perform exquisite hand hygiene all the time. 
And this brings me to the arc of molecular epidemiology. So the field of epidemiology started in around the 1800s with John Snow, no, not from the Night's Watch, but John Snow, the father of modern day epidemiology, who went in uh, London in the 1850s and tracked a cholera outbreak to a single water pump on Broad Street in London, uh, simply by going and collecting information from people affected, uninfected, and creating a map. From this, the field of epidemiology blossomed and has been key in all outbreak investigations. And it is what the CDC defines, uh, helped CDC define what is healthcare associated versus community acquired infection. Uh, healthcare associated generally being something that develops, an infection that develops after through hospital day. Uh, we can also look at bacterial antibiotic profiles since this is a snapshot into their virulence since the, these genetic determinants determine whether they're virulent and resistant. So seeing that two bacteria have the same antibiotic profiles doesn't really help, but if they have different antibiotic antibiograms, you may suggest that they're different genetically. And many outbreak investigations have involved basic typing, such as multilocus sequence typing, pulse field gel electrophoresis, which is now the gold standard still, that look at a subset of genes in the, in the entire genetic population, and it classifies bacteria into subsets. But this doesn't give the whole picture of what's going on. Only at the center of our bullseye do you have genomics, as Dr. Shad explained. It provides a whole picture. So all these other analyses are highly important and incorporated into, an, into the investigation, but only with genomics can you really get the truth. And so why should we apply whole genome sequencing to bacterial studies? Well, for one, we can, uh, since the cost and time to obtaining a genome has dramatically decreased and will continue to decrease as time progresses and technology advances even more. There's more detail in genomics, so as I mentioned, the, uh, you can classify bacteria into clonal groups, but it is noted that there are seven clonal groups of MRSA circulating the entire globe. So just knowing which clonal group your bacteria are in does not help in a local transmission of MRSA. Uh, so uh, there's more information in genomics. Uh, not only do bacteria have a very complex uh, and small core genome, there's an accessory genome which, it, which comprises 30 percent of genomic content. So without capturing that, you, can, you, miss, you may miss a transmission occurring on a non-core chromosomal element, such as a plasmid or another mobile element. So this field is in its infancy, and it's undergoing a revolution right now. Most of the work that's been done, as Dr. Schott has uh, touched upon our retrospective analysis or near real time, but, um, uh, and also global surveillance, so tracking pathogens that are very common, such as influenza, as well as emerging pathogens, such as Zika, as you heard about last week's Grand Round, and um, Ebola. What we're moving towards is real-time detection, so stopping outbreaks in their track, and the future involves more, um, more personalized uh, medicine for bacteria, so looking at the bacteria virulence determinants and antibiotic profiles simply from sequencing them right off the bat and determining what antibiotic to use, how the, the patient will do with this, with this infection, and also um, using whole genome sequencing to bypass routine culture such as uh, for difficult to, to grow pathogens like anaerobes, tuberculosis, and non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And so what has been found to date is that there are actually less transmissions than are occurring than we once thought, based on classic epidemiologic uh, occurrence. So uh, many studies have been done on C. difficile and MRSA, since those are two problematic healthcare-associated infections, and a lot of the work coming out of England, our collaborators there. So while this is great news, um, there's also been some mistransmissions, outbreaks that are occurring that you didn't even pick up based on routine tracking and epi analyses. So both can occur. And why should we do this here at Mount Sinai? Well, um, we have a very busy clinical microbiology lab, and we will get even busier when we centralize the entire healthcare system to our, Mount, our, our clinical micro lab, estimating around 400,000 cultures to be processed per year. As well, uh, across the street, we have the uh, uh, Department of Genomics, uh, chaired by Dr. Schott and Dr. Kosarskis which has grown exponentially over the past couple of years um, to bring very educated and intellectual and amazing minds who want to solve clinical problems with their bioinformatic and technological expertise. So it's great that we have them right across the street. And a special type of sequencer is the PacBio sequencer, um, which is able to produce long read data. And this is extremely important for our bacterial genomes because they're very complicated, as you heard, these extra chromosomal elements, you won't be able to capture that with even uh, more common um, sequencers such as Illumina. You, PacBio is able to produce the entire genome in one circular contig or chromosome. 
So in the idea that we should be doing this, we did this in July 2013. A group of us came together, chaired by Dr. Kasarskis, a group of infectious disease consultants, in infection control, clinical micro lab, um, and it's expanded to include fellows, uh, students, postdocs, and so we're a highly collaborative group, the Pathogen Surveillance Program, which our common goal is to reduce healthcare-associated infections really by trying to challenge those CDC definitions to say this is a truly a community-acquired infection, not from your hospital. So we think we'll be able to reduce the healthcare-associated infection rates as by, by describing them and explaining what is actually happening and assist in outbreak detection as well as telling infection control how to best utilize their resources with the ultimate goal of reducing morbidity and mortality at this hospital. Um, so here's the interplay of how we work. So you have all the samples and your clinical um, EPIC data, which you are generating, go into um, EPIC. This is scraped and our, your, the cultures are, are, are uh, grown in microbiology. A subset of those will be sequenced. This information goes into a pathogen DB, which is a centralized database where we can overlay um, big data information and then put this all together and have a information go back to the patient and to improve care. This was our initial workflow. So infection control would come to us and say, we are concerned about an outbreak. What we would do is gather all the isolate information and the epidemiologic information about the patients. Uh, we would look at the antibiotic profiles. Since I mentioned that looking at those uh, susceptibility profiles will tell you right off the bat whether they're related or not. If they're the same, it doesn't really help. You have to go deeper. But if they are different, this suggests that they are genetically different. Uh, then we can see it with using big data on the data warehouse, if this is a statistically uh, significant increase in cases over time, or you just happen to be seeing it because you happen to be seeing it at that day. So we'll check that. And if all of these are satisfied, we'll proceed to whole genome sequencing and then produce a tree, a phylogenetic tree, which shows the genetic dif distances between these bacteria and then feed this back to infection control. Yes, there's an outbreak. No, this is not an outbreak. What's even better and what we're aiming toward is actually informing infection control of an outbreak. This would be done by uh, prospectively sequencing problematic isolates such as MRSA and C. difficile, creating a phylogenetic tree, and then um, informing infection control of a match between two patients. So if there's a genome match, this suggests that there is transmission and then infection control will be informed. So to date, this, we have collected 8,000 blood cultures from clinical microbiology lab, and this is all centralized in the pathogen DB set up by Dr. Von Bockel and our group. Some of our early work was looking at a transmission of MRSA from a liver donor to a liver recipient. We knew the donor had MRSA in the bloodstream, which was fine. We accepted the organ. The patient, uh, the, the recipient developed MRSA in the bloodstream postoperatively. We did not know if this was from the donor or did this come postoperatively and would be deemed a healthcare associated infection. So we sequenced both and we found them to be 100% identical and exquisitely close to two closest relatives in GenBank. So without doing sequencing, we would have not been able to put this together. They only separated from two references by a translocation and an insertion. And um, it's noted that these two isolates were USA 300, which is the most common clone circulating the, the United States today. So that was completely useless to us to know that information. We did investigate two outbreaks that were deemed not to be true outbreaks. Uh, there was a concern about uh, Burkholderia cepatia in the surgical intensive care <laughs> unit. And we sequenced patient isolates as well as environmental isolates. These were all genetically different, as you can see by the high numbers on the branches of this tree. Uh, likewise, in the solid organ transplant service, there was a concern about a Stenotrophomonas maltophilia outbreak. We sequenced these isolates, and likewise, they, the numbers, as you can see on the tree, were very high, so not a clonal outbreak. However, unfortunately, we did find uh, we helped investigate an MRSA outbreak in the NICU about a year ago, which involved nearly 20 babies. And as you can see, here's our tree, and what we have in the background is a tree of all the, the other isolates occurring at Mount Sinai at the same time. So we've been prospectively sequencing these MRSA isolates and plopping them in the tree. And as you can see in the red, that's our outbreak, um, and that you can see the numbers are zeros and ones. So these are very genetically the same. Um, and if you just did conventional typing, um, as you can see in the green bar, you would have thought that the outbreak extended beyond the borders of the NICU. With, uh, you, you would have seen that they were MLST 105, which is a very common hospital-acquired clone. So knowing that uh, wasn't, was, it wouldn't have been as helpful as really sequencing these isolates and getting to the center of this bullseye. 
Likewise, our group has investigated uh, antibiotic resistance development, and this was led by Dr. Uh, by Ted Pak, an MD-PhD student here. And uh, in our Senatrophomonas outbreak, one patient developed a quinolone-resistant strain after receiving Cipro course. We sequenced both isolates and found that there was one single point mutation which led to the derepression of a multidrug efflux pump, and that led to the resistance. So more work on this is being performed today. Not only can we look between hosts, but we can look within the host and see how these bacteria, for example, at Staph aureus is a very common colonizer, and 30% of us are, have it in, living in our nose without any problem, yet if it enters your bloodstream, it will kill you at a rate of 30%. So what leads to this virulence change? So we're looking at single uh, patient isolates paired between nose and infection source, so infecting and colonizing sites. Not only can we perform phylogenies, we can look deeper at the variants by um, seeing these very small number of variants that are separate these two isolates from one patient and see what the change in virulence is. We can perform RNA-seq by knocking out key regulators and seeing what goes up and down, as well as a phenotyping these. So this is done down with our collaborators at NYU. We can put these isolates into mouse models and cytotoxic cytotoxicity assays and whole blood killing assays and see what uh, the changes occur that lead from colonization to infection. Uh, our group, led by Dr. Bashir and Dr. Von Bockel, uh, received an R01 in C. investigating C. difficile in ICU. C. diff is a big problem here at Mount Sinai, so this is uh, important to do. It's not only looking at transmission networks within the ICU, but looking, touching upon that course, the clinical course between colonization, asymptomatic colonization, to infection re and recurrence of infection, looking at the microbiome of the patients, the EHR, the EPIC data, as well as the, as the genomics of the bacteria. This is all to improve, hope to improve risk prediction models. Future directions, and this is, uh, you know, something that Dr. Schott has touched on, but looking at the epigenetics, so looking at what occurs above the genome. Um, so we have the core genome, uh, we have the, the bases, but there's a whole language above the genome that's that's present that we can actually only capture with um, something like PacBio. Uh, so this was helpful in leading in discovering the virulence in the Germany um, uh, E. coli outbreak since the methylation change led to the increased pathogenicity of the isolate. Likewise, we can slap um, radio frequency ID tags onto your patients and track them through the hospital and overlay the genomic information, the EPIC data, onto an actual map, so kind of going back to John Snow's map, but doing that for our hospital in real time. So this is a piece of equipment going through the hospital over the course of a month. Um, so that is the future. And of course, we cannot forget the host. So our patient developed MRSA in the bloodstream, but let's say multiple patients on the ward at the same time were exposed to the MRSA. So what is it about our patient that led to, the, that, led to that um, occurrence? How come this didn't happen to others? We were looking into host factors, uh, immunologic features, and genomics to help answer that piece. So with that, I'll go segue into Dr. He's talk about the host. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or ask after. If you want to get involved, let us know. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. So now we try to move from a bacteria to humans. So over the next uh, 15 minutes, I'm going to summarize the genetic study in kin disease, which is just uh, impossible, 15 minutes. So, <laughs> so I, I, I try to do is I just, uh, starting by this slide, I'm thinking about that. What's a major discovery over the last 20 years in the field of nephrology? Actually, we, unfortunately, we don't have many. And many of them are actually affiliated, uh, associated with the genetic study. I think the cloning of PKD1 gene is very important, which is uh, you know, in 1995. And then the cloning of the nephrin gene, which really opened all the area of the polar research, it has huge impact in the field of nephrology. And then the recent identification of phospholipase A2 as an antigen for members nephropsy, which is not from genetic study, but more from classic uh, traditional biology. It's also had a huge impact in the field of nephrology. And lastly, is uh, the really from genomic-wise screening and identify APO1 gene as a risk gene for the CKD in African-American, which is really important for us. So the PKD gene is, 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 has a huge impact in the field. And now we can use actually, you know, genetic testing to diagnose the PKD patient in certain uh, situation, which is, uh, I think, has really clinical, you know, 
significance. And since then, actually many PKD gene, related PKD gene, PKD gene has been also identified. And the function of the PKD, including PKD gene in PC1, PC1 and PC2 is being also well studied. However, the treatment is still limited. So I put a picture of Dr. Luca Gisela from a faculty from Reno Division. He's actually really expert, expert in, the, in the biology of the PKD, and uh, he made a significant contribution in this field. So anybody who's interested in the PKD field can talk to him. So the second part is about the discovery of nephrine gene. And since then, the biology of nephrine has been very well studied. And we understand that nephrine is a key molecule to make this slit diaphragm between the portal side foot process. I just put a picture of the scanning electron microscope of the portal side. As you can see, this nice cell we've been actually working for many years. And uh, since then, also many other genes have been discovered. And all this gene actually is responsible, for example, for development and, uh, and the progression of the kin disease, such as uh, uh, focal segmental sclerosis. And at Monsanto, I list all the investors who are being interested in portal cell biology. Actually, we, we actually have, the, I think, one of the best team in, 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 in the country to study the portal cell biology. So I have to mention about the, the discovery of the phospholipase A2 receptor, which is very important because the P phospholipase A2, this antigen, the antibody, uh, you, you can look at in the serum actually has been used as a diagnosis and also a pronostic tool uh, marker for, for, uh, for idiopathic members in the FOPSI. And this is a really important discovery. And uh, actually, you know, I, I'm sure I, I like, you know, that uh, uh, all of you actually remember this because when I was uh, actually making the teaching round, when I asked the house staff about the phospholipase they say two actually, uh, Actually, most of you are actually not aware. I think this is very important. You have to remember that uh, the phospholipase A2 receptor is the antigen which is responsible for this disease, which is a uh, Mambus nephropsy. It's interesting, just two years later, by GWAS study of this disease, they also identify phospholipase A2, which is uh, the, the, the polymorphism or mutation of these genes associated with uh, members in the So genetic study happens after actually the, the classical biological study, but they validate the finding. However, the function, how this mutation contributes to this disease still remains unclear. So the major discovery about this APOM1 is really has significant impact in, in the field of kin disease. We know that this risk, APOM1 risk allele, or called G1, G2, can contribute significantly in the development of kin disease. For example, for the HIV kin disease, to having this risk allele, you almost have 29 high you know, increase of odds ratio for HIV kin disease. For non-HIV kin disease, the, so having this risk area, you almost have a more than tenfold increase of odds ratios. So it's a huge, it's a very significant. And we also know now that APO1 genes associated with disease progression, and it can be also used to predict the remission and the recurrence of kin disease. So it has a huge clinical impact too. Again, the function of this gene in kidney injuries remains unclear. So we still don't know how this gene contributes to the development of the disease. So at SANA, we also have a team actually being studied the, the biology of the APOM1 in kin disease, including Dr. Ross being funded by NIH to look at the, the low APOM1, and Dr. White is also do, look, studying the HIV kin disease, and, uh, and APOM1 is, uh, has a major role for that. And uh, Dr. Actually, um, Nadkani is also working at the K, actually working on the APOM1 gene in the, in the hypertension kin disease. So we have a really a strong team to try to understand the, actually the biology of the APOM1 uh, in kin disease here. So the disease, the most common kin disease actually in the world, also in this country, is diabetic kin disease. And myself, I just spent the last 20 years to try to understand the pathogenesis of disease. So this disease, as you can see, the progression is I highlight here by different colors, the curves, it's really so different among the individual diabetic patients. Some patients can have a rapid progression, some patients have a very slow progression or non-progressive. This suggests genetics should play a major role in the progression of diabetic kidney disease. However, over the last 10, 15 years, 
Many groups I just spend a lot of time to look at the genetic factor responsible for the progression of diabetes and disease actually I kind of failed. I summarize here two major studies, one called Fine Study, another one called Go King Study. This is a major study using genomic-wide approach to understand the, you know, try to identify the risk factor for diabetes and disease. And a none of loss I associate with this disease with acceleration more than two. Interesting, APO1 gene we know associated with the uh, in the kin disease in African American. And we also know diabetic kin disease is more common in African American. However, <laughs> AP1 gene is not associated with diabetic kin disease in African American, which is really strange for us. So what's happened for diabetic kin disease? So people you know, think about that maybe it's a, it's a multiple variant with small effect. You add it all together to have a major effect. It could be a rare variant. It could not be detected by current GWA study. So maybe you have to increase the sample size, which is actually Brawlings in Boston. They are doing that. They try to get more and more patients and try to perform again the GWA study to identify the risk factor associated with diabetic kidney disease. It could be also because the patient population is so heterogenetic. And Many diagnoses for diabetic kidney disease is not biopsy proven. So in the patient they used for GWAS study, many patients may not have a diabetic kidney disease. So that's another major issue. And we also know diabetic kidney disease has strong environmental factor. And this could be through some epigenetic you know, mechanism instead of just change of DNA structures. So talking about uh, I mentioned about that, uh, Dr. Shad also mentioned about that, uh, the something beyond genomics. We know that genomics just give us DNA sequence and structures, but you know, many things that we don't understand, actually what's the function of this change? That's why the term called the functional genomic, you can read this you know, in the Wikipedia if you want. It's, uh, everything's written the <laughs> genomic, uh, functional genomics. So the one of the approach to understand the function genomics is just by integration of the different omic data set. And Dr. Shashuda's very nice uh, you know, cartoon picture to tell us how you integrate all this omic data set from, I put it in this summary slide, from a genome, meaning signaling pathway, down to the metabolome. So now we have a tool to screening all different network and we can integrate by different you know, computational programs. So I give you here one of the example how we integrate genomic with transcriptome. This is done actually by Dr. Murphy's, uh, your chairman, our chairman here. So this study is a, is a, is a called genomic uh, for you know, chronic uh, renal allograve uh, rejection called Go, uh, Go, 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 Go study. Dr. Murphy is a PR for this study. So study essentially done actually after kidney transplant, I put a zero here. So the kidney biopsy was done at, uh, sorry, at the three months. And the one piece of kidney actually has been using for microarray study. And then the patient got, you know, the GFR is done actually at six months, 12 months. And the patient's lip biopsy at 12 months. And that stage is so we can have a histology analysis of the patient. Therefore, we, what we can do is just uh, can have the expression of the gene at the early stage and to predict what's outcome at 12 months, which is based on eGFR and also histology change. And what's interesting, they found that actually one of the gene called SHROOM3 is pushing at the three months and highly correlated with the CADI score, which is a histology change of the graft at 12 months, and also negative correlated with EGFR at the six, at 12 months. But the, interestingly, there's a study also by GWA study. People found that SHROOM3 has a, this a polymorphism, which is highly associated with the progression of the CKD. And when we look at the carefully about this, polymorphism. It's interesting because this change of uh, nucleic acid, it really changed the sequencing to a consensus binding site for a TCF left. And TCF left is a transmitting factor downstream of the wing beta catenin pathway. So this, even the change of SNPs in the intro, intronic area can affect a binding site of the transmitting, a major transmitting factor. And through a lot of cell biology and molecular biology study, finally confirmed that this is very important because this change of SNPs to SHROOM3 really can, because activated this beta-catenin pathway, 
causing increasing expression in HUMS3. And increasing expression in HUMS3 can activate TG beta signal pathway, leading to kidney fibrosis. We also know TG beta can actually upregulate the beta catenin pathway, therefore really forming a virtual cycle leading to the progression of kidney disease through fibrosis. So it's, a, it's really a novel mechanism demonstrated here. So this is actually the, the, using the same actual cohort that the Murphy's group actually has a recent paper in Lancet dem demonstrating that certain genes set from this study actually was independent predictor for the development of fibrosis at the one year with really high prediction rate. And this is even better than the clinical indicator. So it's a, this is a very important study. I encourage you, all of you to read it. So we actually, the second example I'd like to give to you is uh, we actually published a paper, this paper in Nature Medicine a couple years ago in collaboration with Avi Maya, a faculty in the pharmacology department. So we developed a program to deduce actually from gene array, microarray data, to upstream signaling pathway through the transcript factor and all this network analysis. And we identify one of the kinase called hip kinase 2, which is really responsible for all the change of the gene in the diseased kidney. And in addition, we found actually really through many animal study and also cell biology study, we found that this hip kinase 2 actually contribute to kidney fibrosis through activation of many pathways including by activation profibosis marker, inducing cell apoptosis and inflammation. So hip kinase 2 is really a master kinase responsible for kidney fibrosis. And recently, we developed a specific hip kinase 2 inhibitor, and we already have a preclinical data confirming that inhibitor can really improve kidney fibrosis. So, so hopefully in the next few years, we can move this drug to the clinical trials. The so last two slides I'd like to say is how we integrate the genomic study to human study. So there's, I think, Monsanto has a lot of great resources. One of that is it's called a BIMI, BiBank, which I think you should be aware of that. So this BIMI actually has been, you know, essentially we've been collecting samples over the last uh, almost 10 years. All the patients walking into uh, into the clinic at Monsanto, we try to get consent form and also, you know, get a, 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 a uh, blood samples. And now we have total like 35 southern patients being collected at Monsanto. This is actually especially, you know, this is done by the actual IPM Institute of Personalized Medicine. And interesting, among these patients, we have more than 4,000 patients with CKD. Dr. Xia just mentioned to me this looks like too many CKD patients for this patient population. I tried to explain to him because the the director of this IPMO is Dr. Bollinger, who's a nephrologist. He corrected some more actual CKD patients, but that's good for us, for the nephrology research. So we have really a lot of CKD patients for, you know, among the, these biomarkers. And we know the SNPs data is available for most patients, and then Monsanto just signed a contract with the Regeneron to perform exome sequencing for all these patients. So it's lucky for us that so we will have exome sequencing for the 4,000 CKD patients. This is really great. And all this genetic information could be linked to clinical information in the EMR, which is also very important. So the last slide I want to say is a, is a, is a study actually uh, will be done by Dr. Koga, uh, one of the faculty in the renal division. I think it's a very important study. So as you know, the, we, for the CKD, we're still using the S inhibitor ARB to treat patient with CKD, that's the only drug available, which we feel really bad for that, because over the last 20 years, we haven't developed any new drug, and many clinical studies have been failed with new drug. So one of the reasons, there are many reasons, but one of the reasons is just because we don't have a good, actually, patient, pop, you know, patient cohort for clinical study. So Dr. Koga tried to develop this, he called highly sub endophenotyped patient cohort to conduct more efficient clinical trial for CKD. Therefore, we can maybe, you know, develop, efficiently develop the, the, the drug for, for, the, for this patient population. So the approach he used is a patient from the BIMI, just I described. So uh, we know we have all the genetics in the, uh, uh, profile because even the exome sequencing will be available for this patient population. We also have all this uh, data from the EMR. So he, not only the data actually we call the, 
the structured data like uh, lab data can be summarized, can be in integrated with genomics, but also all this uh, so-called unstructured data. Unstructured data is what that means. It's uh, like uh, you actually write every day the progress note and, uh, and uh, HP. All this data is very difficult to integrate, usually. So that Koga is going to use the uh, natural language processing software. We try to also extract efficiently, you know, all this information from uh, from all these nodes to uh, from EMR to to integrate with uh, with the genetic data set. In addition, he had this uh, mesoscale multiple plex uh, ELISA form. He can measure multiple biomarkers of kidney injury at the same time. So we have been collecting the sample actually from all the CKD patients, including blood and urine sample, and we can measure all the biomarkers in this patient. So at the end, he can incorporate the genetic data, the information from obtained from uh, uh, EMR, and all this biomarker from blood and urine, and therefore, based on that, he can identify really we call the high risk patient population to design a study for the new drugs. So, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, I think we have a few minutes for questions, a couple of, couple of questions. If the speakers want to come up or stand up if they get a question. So, any questions from? The audience? Everybody's bamboozled. Outstanding presentations. Yep. There. Uh, Italia. Thanks, everybody. That was great. I'm curious to hear all of your thoughts about the future of large scale epigenetic analysis for patients. Um, you talked about sort of scratching the surface, but what do you foresee as the ability to scale up? So on the epigenetics of patients? Yeah, so I think, uh, like again, as the technologies advance and technologies like PacBio and the Oxford Nanopore can, at the same time as the sequencing assay, detect the modifications that are happening to the DNA. So we've had a number of papers in Nature Biotech and Nature Methods over the last couple of years on the ability to do that. And as that cost like drops and as the handheld devices come to be, like you can imagine, um, that being done routinely on individuals and in environments and sort of tracking in real time the evolution of those um, sorts of changes. So my, I think it's just going to track with the accessibility of the technology, the advancement of that, and, and the cost being driven down that it will ultimately come simultaneously with the DNA se sequence. And, and for outbreak investigations, as we saw in the E. coli outbreak, it wasn't necessarily the the core genome, but it was the epigenome that led to the drone. So I think not only sequencing and making phylogenetic trees for the bacteria core genome, we can do that for epigenetic profiles as well and see the methylation changes and maybe something's tracking on that as opposed to the core genome. So I think for, it'll just get more and more accessible. So the, the epigenetic study for kidney disease actually is kind of difficult. As we know, the epigenetic study is very cell specific. So for example, if we have a whole glomerular, you have a four different kinds of cells, the information from a glomerular may not tell us, you know, exactly specific cell type. So it's challenging. So far over, you know, we haven't had the, the data about the epigenetic study. Question down the back that was there first, I'll just come in and up and then have uh, so uh, in oncology there have been a lot of new drugs in recent years that are frankly expensive and clearly don't work in everybody or work only for a short time. Now, one of these drugs uh, can only be given to people who have the proper graph uh, problem. And the question then is, in how many drugs now otherwise are you able to predict who is not going to be able to respond? In how many patients who are responding but then lose their response, can you identify another possible pathway that could be uh, inhibited in order to have another drug to be given? Yeah, perfect. So we had a paper just in genome medicine that reviewed the results of our personalized cancer therapy study. And we, what we showed in that paper is that I think 90, it was like 95% of the time, 90% of the time, we were able to come up with actionable guidance of pathways that were either activated or suppressed and that would indicate um, specific treatment 
you know, that, that should be given, given the myriad of drugs that are targeting the different cancer pathways. So I think the ability that we have today is we can always make those predictions. I think the, the question you, you're getting to though is how accurate are those? And those are the studies, like lots of studies running now, assessing whether the calls that we're able to make, do they, do they actually correlate with response or do they lead to better outcomes? So I think we're still in the in the midst of, of trying to resolve that, but feeling pretty bullish that you know we can today with very high accuracy look at the 20 most common cancer pathways that are activated or suppressed in driving tumors and call them as being activated or suppressed. And so I think you know the ability is there, and it's just now matching that to clinical outcome. And uh, those studies are going on right now. So hopefully in the next few years those uh, results are clear. One last question. Yeah, let me just ask you, if, uh, if people have certain specific problems, for example, statins and myalgia is severe, and you've already started collecting some uh, uh, genetic information, what is the approach to the group of, of you all to sort of begin discussing what one can do, if anything, really, for that sort of data? It's just, you have so many things going on, at such, you know, and some apparently more important because of you know, death and that sort of thing. But what would be the best way to sort of begin any sort of exploration with you all, whether that would be uh, something that one could do? So I think that, you know, the, the BAMI data set that I mentioned about bank that has all the certified some patients, we identify from an EMR, which are, you know, patients, they have starting issues. And then maybe after, maybe if we have exam sequencing available, definitely can look at about the genetic uh, factor which may associate with this. But trying to do an exploration to find a cause, I mean, it's, so today for the Mendelian disorder, so undiagnosed conditions that appear to have a strong genetic component, appear sort of Mendelian, that in roughly 25 to 30 percent of the cases in carrying out whole genome sequencing, are the, can those cases be resolved in a clinical uh, diagnosis? Uh, but even those cases take you know, an individual you know, half a year to, to come up with that. And then there's a 75% of the other people where that's not so obvious, and that can take years because now you're doing functional studies based on hypotheses generated. So it, in my mind, it's more of a, like we're in this process of learning, like how do we, how do we go through that data and automate it and not take six months to come up with that identification, but do it in minutes. And I think until we learn enough on how to do that, it's, it's like one of these where it's just an expensive game because you can imagine the number of cases in this kind of health system that, that would be of the type you'd be interested in. And we have maybe four or five people here who are even capable of doing that. And then they're all, like we don't get reimbursed for that stuff, right? The, the, so, so just at this point in that, in, again, in that complicated state where we're, you know, unfortunately all learning and I think five to ten years from now will be much more automated and fast and routine. Uh, but today, that's it's it's not the case. It's still very much in the science. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir.